In the last video, we started our study of morphology, and we looked at morphemes. A morpheme is a minimal unit of meaning, and there's many ways to describe morphemes, and one of them is describing them as either roots or affixes. So a root is the core meaning of the word, and the affix adds a certain grammatical dimension or maybe changes the meaning a little bit. In this video, we're going to take a detailed look at affixes and what is the relationship is between affixes and roots. So we're going to describe affixes by their position relative to the root. We're going to call them prefixes if they've come before the root, suffix if they come afterwards, a circumfix if they are around the root, both before and after, and we call it, we're going to call them an infix if they break into the root and sort of nestle in the middle. We're also going to describe how languages combine morphemes in their words. There's languages that are called isolating because they keep one morpheme in one word, and their words are generally just one morpheme per word. There's languages that are called fusional, where a single morpheme can pack a lot of meanings inside of one morpheme. There's languages that are agglutinative, where each morpheme tends to have one meaning, but morphemes can still be stuck together, like little Lego pieces. And we're going to look at, exam at examples of polysynthetic languages, which have words that can have several roots and several affixes combined. All right, you know English. English has prefixes and suffixes. For example, in cats, there is a, an affix here that's a suffix because it comes after the root. In unbreakable, we have one prefix that comes before the root and one suffix, ubble, which comes after the root. Suffixes and prefixes are used for verbal conjugations in many languages. For example, in Spanish, we use suffixes to conjugate verbs. You can have a, a word like toco, as in I play a musical instrument, or tocas, you play like a musical instrument. So we have the very stable root toc right here, and we have two suffixes, one that means first person present, and the other one second person present. So these suffixes conjugate the verb. In Navajo, uh, Navajo does the same thing with prefixes. So we have a, uh, these words, nashne and nanine, they mean I am playing a musical instrument, you are playing a musical instrument. Ne is the root, it means to play. Na is a prefix, an inflectional prefix that tells you that something is a continuous aspect, that something is happening uh, continuously. And then these prefixes here, esh and ni, tell you that the verb is being done by the first person, I, or the second person, you. So, Spanish uses su suffixes for verbal conjugation. Navajo uses prefixes for verbal conjugation. And by the way, you remember that Swahili uses prefixes too to tell you who the first and the second person are. So we have prefixes and suffixes. Languages can have circumfixes, which are essentially both a prefix and a suffix at the same time. They go around a root. So in Malay, we have roots like raja, uh, king, and if you put this circumfix around it, which is used for expressing abstract qualities, we get words like kerajan, kingdom. From banyak, many, we can make kebanyakan, majority. From gelisa, anxious, we can make kegelisahan, anxiety. The circumfix mem kan is to cause something. So bersih is uh, the adjective to, uh, to be clean. Membersihkan means to cause to be clean, to clean something up. Bangun, for someone to be awake or to wake up. Membangunkan means for someone to wake up somebody else, to cause them to be awake. And finally, we have the circumfix mei, which is means to add something. So we have the root warna, color. Mewarnai means to add color to something, to color. So circumfixes go around the root. Infixes break into a root and yeah, just nestle in there. 
So the language Tagalog from the Philippines uses infixes to conjugate its verbs. The infix um means past tense and that the verb is focusing on the subject, on whoever's doing the verb. So bumasa ako, uh, bumasa ako ng libro means I read a book. The root is basa to read or it could be sulat to write. And the um goes right in the middle. Bumasa, sumulat. There's another infix, in, which also means past tense, but that the focus of the action is on the object. Binasa ko ang libro means I read the book. And again, we have roots like basa and sulat, and then the in breaks right in. Binasa, sinulat. So we can describe morphemes by the relationship to the root. They can come before as a prefix, after as a suffix, around it like a circumfix, or inside as an infix. We can also describe a language by how it clusters its morphemes, its morphemes together. So in isolating languages, one word tends to have one morpheme. Vietnamese is like that. We can have a word like um, hoa si, draw expert, which means artist. So this means draw, this means expert, and they're two separate words. In English, artist is two morphemes in a single word. Likewise, phi nya, not righteous, not righteous. We have one word per morpheme. In English, we have three morphemes, un, ethic, all. A root, a prefix, and a suffix. And in Vietnamese, even the verbal conjugations are their own words. So, toi da an, I ate. In this sentence, the past tense is the word uh, da, its own little word. It is not, uh, it is not like a part or an alteration of the verb to eat, as it would be in English, where we say eats or ate. So these are isolating languages. Many languages you have studied are fusional languages. This is Spanish, English, French, Latin, most European languages. In fusional languages, you have one morpheme, and then you stick a lot of meanings inside of that one morpheme. For example, in Spanish, we have the root com, and then this little morpheme o. And this morpheme means that it's the first person, it's singular, it's the present, and that the, the verb is in fact happening. It is called indicative. So this means I eat. And this little O is doing a lot of heavy lifting. It has all of these four meanings, meanings stuck into it. The word komi also has one little morpheme that's doing a lot of work. E means that it's first, singular, past, that it's perfect, so the action is complete, and that it's indicative, so it did happen. I ate komi. So one morpheme, lots of meanings, and stuck, it's stuck inside that one little morpheme. In agglutinative languages, uh, meanings are spread apart, so each morpheme tends to have one bit of meaning, but the morphemes still stick together, like Lego pieces. Turkish and Swahili are examples of agglutinative languages. So, for example, in Turkish, yerim means I eat, and yedim means I ate. And you can see that there's a piece here that means the present tense, and a bit here that means the past tense, and a separate bit that means I in both of them. And the tense and the person are separated in their own little morpheme. So agglutinative languages tend to have one meaning per morpheme and then to bunch those morphemes up together. Swahili is like that. Nidikula has one morpheme for the past tense and one morpheme for the person. Finally, in polysynthetic languages, you can have many roots and affixes smushed into a single word. So in Nahuatl, you can have a word like nitashkas chihua, I tortilla make. And that would be a single word where you have mixed the direct object and the verb. This word, nito nel kochi, means I sleep all day, but it would literally be something like I day sleep, which again, day sleep would be a single compound word. We call these languages polysynthetic languages. The language tiu from Australia can has is very polysynthetic. You can have a word like which means they, it, the dead wallaby, carry on their shoulders in the past.
they would carry the dead wallaby on their shoulders. And this is just one word with, as you can see, root, both roots and uh, affixes in a single word. So in summary, there's many ways to classify morphemes. You can classify them by their position relative to the root, uh, before, as in a prefix, after, suffix, around, circumfix, inside, infix. You can also describe a language by how it clusters its morphemes. Uh, an isolating language tends to have one word per morpheme. A fusional language has many morphemes in a word, but those morphemes have a lot of meanings inside of them. Agglutinative languages have many morphemes, and each morpheme tends to have a single meaning, and they're like Lego pieces. And polysynthetic languages tend to have several roots and affixes in a single word.